Welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, we talk with Michelle Chula Lipkin, Executive Director of the National Association for Media Literacy Education, or namely, our focus, how media literacy can help us navigate news and information in the time of COVID-19, and the challenges we face when media literacy skills are lacking. As I think many of us do, I have loved ones getting information from sources that have passed on misinformation. And in this current context, misinformation can actually get someone killed. We already know of a man in Nigeria who died after taking an untested medication mentioned by the president. And so I think media literacy has become this really um, heightened thing for for me. And so anyways, I guess maybe let's just start there. I mean, how do you see media literacy playing a role in this current moment? It's kind of shocking in so many ways, this current moment in time. You know, just when we think we've hit this peak of misinformation or peak of issues with um, the flow of information and the overwhelm, it's like a fire hose, right? That there is another bigger fire hose behind it, just like after the you know 2016 election when people were starting to pay attention to media literacy. Now we have this health crisis, which is different than political um, conversation. The fact that the misinformation is about a health crisis is so terrifying, right? Because we have information out there that is false and dangerous in a way that is not necessarily the same as other types of misinformation. Yes, there's danger in misinformation, but this is actual people's health and the choices that people are making about their health based on the information they're getting and the idea that they could be taking misinformation um, to heart and making decisions that put themselves in danger is really just... It's very scary. And that's why I'm certainly glad that I'm in the media literacy space. You know, the core goals of media literacy are asking questions. You know, so we want people to take their time to think about the information they're consuming and sharing and creating and to ask questions about it. In this like health crisis, it's almost like there isn't even enough time to train people on that. And what we need to focus on is just please don't share information you can't verify. Like simply, like if you don't have time to ask questions, if you feel rushed, if you feel like there's so much information coming out at you, then let's just focus on not sharing it. Like not sharing it if you can't guarantee, if you can't, if you aren't 100% sure that it, it is real and it is factual, then can you just not share it? Media literacy, it's, it's, it's farther away. It's out there. It's something we need to work on. And it's something that's, you know, it's, it's causing us to not be able to talk with each other. And it's causing us to have different, not shared realities. We know that there's some detriment to it, but it feels big or far away. It's not necessarily happening on my street. And now we're in this moment where we had a media literacy challenge issue crisis prior to this pandemic. And we're in a moment where this pandemic it definitely threatens lives on a very uh, immediate scale. And the idea of distilling media literacy education down to one critical message, which is don't share. And in a, in a critical time, you know, why do you think that's the message? Why do you think just don't share it is the message that you have settled on in this moment? I think it's the, the ease of it, you know, and, and I'm disappointed that I need to even make it one point, you know, because to me, media literacy is a process, right? It's who made this message? Why was it made? What was the purpose? What is left out? We really should be doing all that, but we have to recognize that we are in a different world right now. We are in a different ecosystem. And so people need to know one quick thing that they can do to help stop the spread of misinformation. We're sending out a lot of messages about the importance of, you know, knowing the information that you're consuming is, um, you know, expert information, quality information. Because I think that's the other thing is that we talk so much about the misinformation and disinformation that sometimes we forget to talk about, well, how do I find quality information? If you don't have the time to ask the questions you should be asking about who made the message and about, you know, the purpose of the message, if you don't have time to do that, then don't share it. 
just and it's as simple as that like just don't share it and the cutting and the pasting of different tweets and text and without a source and not even being able to find like where did this information even come from if you can't answer that question if you can't answer where this information so- was sourced from then please stop spreading it like please like that is not helpful like right now and it's simply it's like the it's the equivalent of stay home like don't share not only are we seeing a lot of misinformation but we're seeing misinformation from sources that i think traditionally we sort of count on to trust such as public officials we're in this space now where it's like well i should be able to count on the president of the united states at least to sort of give me information that's at least generally in the right direction and we've got demonstrable evidence that we're not getting that. And so I was wondering if you could address the idea of traditionally sound sources becoming uh, maybe less sound. The intersection between this pandemic and the political space in the U.S. is really unfortunate, right? Because we're at such a polarized moment in our country and we're in an election year, which that polarization just rises. And on top of that, having to deal with an unprecedented health crisis, right? So this is a really difficult intersection just as a society and as a culture to deal with. And on top of that, we do have a president that, you know, his intention might be to get people to worry less, to feel confident, to feel, you know, that we have a strong footing and we have a strong defense against this. But the problem with politicians kind of going off the cuff is that information might not be proven, right? And this is really difficult. And the idea that we do need to even fact check these national news conferences, it's very tricky, right? You want to be able to believe the people at the top. And, you know, unfortunately, I think that's where, you know, I look toward, you know, our governor in New York State, Andrew Cuomo, is doing a really great job leading at this moment. And it doesn't mean that he gets everything right, because that's also we're all humans and we're all dealing with an unprecedented crisis. So we're going to make mistakes. Like, let's, you know, give each other a little bit of patience. But to know that you are going to be listening to your leaders and really, really trusting that they're steering the ship in the right way. You could complain a lot. You could get frustrated a lot. But there's no benefit of that, right? So what we have to know is how to process all of this information. We can't make assumptions that people are um, accurate and information is moving so fast. So we have to put some onus, some responsibility on ourselves, unfortunately, right? So we have to be able on a daily basis to say, okay, so this is what the federal government said. This is what our president said. This is what our um, governor said. This is what I'm seeing from the CDC. This is what I'm reading on uh, some of these news sources and really try to process all of this information. Um, and that's really hard because um, it means that we have to do some extra work. And that is sometimes, I think, the most frustrating thing for people is this idea that they do need to pause, that they do need to think about the flow of information. We have to piece together kind of a healthy diet so that we know that we're getting several points of view. Um, and not necess- when I say points of view, it means, you know, from a journalism outlet and a health outlet and, you know, like a various perspectives. Um, and we need to be able to kind of think through that that information on our own and come up with some of our own assessment also. And that's a really difficult thing just in general because of social media and the speed of information. But certainly the stakes are higher now, for sure. The idea of the stakes being higher, many of us across the country are sheltering in place. I'm in California and Governor Gavin Newsom is also, I feel, doing a great job leading. And, and nobody's perfect, but I feel... Uh, you know, based on some of the actions, I can I can trust him. I'll certainly verify. I'm a journalist. I'm going to trust, but verify. Yeah. But, but I feel like I can, in general, trust him, and that's that's nice to have, and it's it's soothing and it's calming in a time like this. But we're all captive inside this shelter in place, or many of us are. Yeah. And people are rushing to information, as you know. Whenever there's breaking news, 
people want to find out more. And now what else do we have to do, right? We're sitting at home. So we're going to go online and, and check out what's happening. And then in that, in that zone, we're more susceptible than ever to all of these messages. You brought up something that I think is really interesting is that now it's like people are at home. So they have more time to think about the virus, to watch the news, to get their notifications, to consume media messages around it. When you think about digital well-being, that's actually exactly the opposite of what we should be doing right now. Like turn off your notifications. You don't need to know everything that happens the moment it happens. Unless you are kind of on the front line, if you don't need to know that for your work or for people that you love, then make a healthy plan for your day when it comes to information. Like I decided, you know, I'm a media literacy educator. I run a national organization around media literacy. And since we've been quarantined, I've been consuming less news. I've been very, very particular about the time of the day that I consume my news and which sources I'm using. Um, Because I have to recognize that I'm in the epicenter of this virus being in New York City. I have kids to care for, I have an organization to run, and I have my mental health to think about. And so I'm very, very particular on my diet of news and I stick to it. And obviously if something major happens during the day, somehow I'll find out about it. But I think we have to be really careful about what we think is being informed in this crisis and taking care of ourselves and the people around us. I mean, especially if you're a parent at home, like with children, like you don't need to have the news on all day. You you just don't. You need to think about your well-being in the middle of all of it. The recommendations that are made for our health, for our well-being, for our mindset are the same recommendations that we should be thinking about when it comes to media and media literacy. Structure your consumption of news and make sure you do the research so you know what's in it or, you know, what's in it for food, right? But who the source is. You know, there are experts. There are experts in this space and we should listen to them. And we should know where to find them. And luckily, we have the CDC, we have the WHO, we have doctors and nurses who are giving us information, um, who are experts in this. And we need to know that like going to the CDC every day um, to see what updates they have might be a valuable use of your time and to start sometimes there. You know, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be asking questions and, you know, we should be questioning all information, but we do have to start with expertise, I think is really important. You mentioned earlier, you know, someone who's a senior and a lot of my students who are seniors are just, they're so sad and they feel isolated. And sometimes their only link is to information, to social media, to this. And and for teaching, you know, I'm trying to provide them with a structure and with connection so that they have that in their lives, but also these tools that they need to to impose structure on themselves when it comes to digital media consumption and information consumption and choices. As you say, something like the CDC, I'm not going to check every day in my general life, but when there's an issue that the CDC is relevant for, such as this moment, then maybe it is appropriate to go to the CDC and the WHO and check in. And then maybe if I don't quite understand what's there, I find a reputable source that's analyzing the information there. Yes, The push and pull of this moment in time, I I think, is also the role of technology and communication in helping us get through this. There's going to be a seismic change in our relationship with technology. I think about all my parent workshops that I do like all the time with parents and the conversations that they have with me about how much time their kids spend on their phone and how they're not connecting and they're not communicating. And now we are completely switched that, right? The only communication and connecting that they're doing with their friends are through social media or through texts or through FaceTime and it's keeping them connected, right? So to me, these amazing um, technology shifts in, in our communication systems, the social media, all of that, we're going to have a different 
framework for how we think about these tools um, because we are dependent on them right now to keep us connected to the people and the things we love. And that I think from a media literacy perspective, that is absolutely fascinating. You're listening to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. Today, we're talking with Michelle Chula Lipkin, Executive Director of the National Association for Media Literacy Education, or namely. What people do need to understand, though, is that you can create your feeds differently now than you might have a month ago, right? Now, I know that, you know, there's algorithms and obviously Facebook and and Instagram, like, you know, we're getting information that we're not asking for and we're getting it in order that we're not asking for. I get that. But you can control some of it. If right now what you need is to connect with people on social media, then maybe you don't need to follow a thousand news accounts. Maybe right now you can do your news a little differently, right? You can go to websites and you can just filter out some of that so that you can still get that connection with people without also being kind of forced into the breaking news aspect of it. We do need to recognize that there is a connection and a bond that we're getting from social media, but that we can protect ourselves from any any person or any outlet that we don't think is good for us right now. Unfollow people, unfollow, you know, sources that are making you stressed and just start with the people that you love and that you want to keep in touch with, you know? So I think there's ways that we can be healthier and just take care of ourselves a little more. I love that you brought that up because we forget that we have some level of power here. We have some level of agency when it comes to dealing with our social media feeds. And I think people just forget that. can point to my students, I guess. When you ask them, hey, where did you get that? What's the source? Oh, I got it on Instagram or I got it on Twitter. No, no, no. That's not the source. What's the source of it? No, no, no. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And um, oh, my goodness. There's this sort of, it is what it is. It's all coming at me. And it's like, well, no, no, you actually created that feed, you know, by the choices you made, what you viewed, what you decided to follow, et cetera. Yes, there's an algorithm and you can't necessarily control that. It's very powerful. But there are things you can do to mitigate during this moment. And it just takes a little bit of work and a little bit of uh, deliberate uh, action. The intention of many people is to stay informed, right? To stay up to date. But we don't ask ourselves, what does that actually mean? And to recognize that you can't keep up. You cannot keep up. It is not possible. Do not even try. <laughs> right. Like, just stop trying. Like, it is impossible. So what you need to do is have your routines, have your, I keep saying it, have your diet, you know, and just know that knowing at the time that the death rate goes up, like that doesn't make you more informed than the person next to you, right? Like if I get that information at the end of my day or in the, on my morning walk because I listen to a podcast, like that's fine. Being informed and taking care of yourself can sometimes be disconnected. You need to know in this moment what it means to be informed is different than what it meant a month ago. I mean, that's the truth. And people have to decide what exactly is it that I need to be informed about. I need to be informed about, uh, for me, I guess I'll talk, what's going on in my community. I am curious about the numbers. I want to know sort of what's happening in the wider space with the numbers. And I need to be informed that people that I love in their spaces, they're okay. And, and if I can prioritize the choices about what I need to be informed about, then I can curate my digital media spaces to give me primarily that. And certainly there might be other stuff that comes in, but I can manage my well-being. I can manage my, I can manage my diet of information without being uninformed. We do have a responsibility to understand what is happening so that we can act responsibly and then we can respond responsibly because, you know, at some point we are going to get on the other side of this and we're going to reflect on how our leaders acted and how our systems coped or didn't cope and where we are broken, right, as a society. And 
we're going to need to have the energy and the focus to be able to do that reflection to make change. You know, one of the things we also have to just be concerned about is just information fatigue, right? You know, we're going to get exhausted by this and we're not never going to want to hear the word COVID-19 after this or think about social distancing, but we actually are going to have to do a lot of work after this is over to ensure our systems are in place for the general health of society, but also if something like this happens again, whether in our lifetime or the next lifetime, right? So what my board has been thinking about is like, what happens in September? What happens when teachers go back into the classroom and they're with students that are potentially traumatized from what happened in the spring, right? We're not going back to normal, people. (laughs) Like, we're not going back to normal. Like, we are entering a new stage of society and and human life. And so what is our response going to be to that? And that's, from a media literacy perspective, I'm really interested in also reflecting on how this crisis was covered by the news, what content came from it, what stood out, what did people choose to do with their time, you know, in terms of like information and communication and bringing the media and the conversation that was happening into the classroom in a reflective manner, I think will be really important for media literacy educators in the fall. I agree with you. And I think media literacy educators, educators in general, academics, intellectuals are going to meet this moment. I think to play devil's advocate, my concern is that society might be unable to meet this moment. I feel that there have been so many moments in our recent past that we have failed to meet. I'm just thinking of uh, the Sandy Hook shooting. I'm thinking of disaster responses. Moments I feel that we're less and less able to meet or develop consensus around And I hope that this is our turning point. I do want us societally to meet this moment with a a collective call for better preparedness, a collective call for taking care of each other, a collective call for whatever it is that needs to happen. I love that meet the moment. That is such a powerful (laughs) statement, like, and it's such a powerful, like, tagline, (laughs) like, meet the moment. Like, I do, and I know what you mean about the fear. And I think this, you know, the Sandy Hook, Tragedy is really, I think, for many of us, that example, you know, where it was like, if that didn't shift our conversations about gun control, what would? And I think that's a a really interesting um, kind of analogy with this moment in time. I am forever optimistic. I I can't even, I don't even know, I don't think I could get through the day if I wasn't. So I have to believe that we're going to be on the right path. And we don't need everyone, right? We need True. A, most. True. Um, it only takes a small group, right, of committed citizens to change the world. True. And I do feel like what is happening right now in the education space and the way teachers and administrators and school leaders are meeting this moment, that is one place that I hope that we can change our kind of cultural thinking about the value of teachers and administrators and people in the school system. So I I do, I want to believe we'll meet this moment. And I'm totally stealing that phrase for you <laughs> from you forever. No problem. I got it here first. <laughs> sourced I love by it. Gina. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I take your point. I'm actually an ever optimist as well. I got to play devil's advocate. And I do have my concerns, but I do believe we can do this. Um, What are some things you think will come out of this moment in time? What I'm most interested in or fascinated by is the idea that right now we are connecting through technology. When there are a lot of stereotypes about technology being kind of a distancing force in society, like keeping us away from each other. I really truly believe that what people are seeing now is the value of technology, the value of virtual connection. And I think that will have a shift in the way we think about technology and even how we think about human connection. And I think that's going to be huge. Not that I think that it will replace. When I talk to young people or I I talk to people that really love social media and technology, they still love face-to-face. They still want to be with their friends, but if not, they'll be on social media with them. So for me, it's that thinking about what 
does it mean to be connected and how that relates to technology that I think is shifting every day that we are in quarantine. We're getting an onslaught of information about COVID-19. And there are other big news stories. The U.S. Census is critical for funding and this and that, but it's not immediate. I'm wondering if you have anything to say about filtering information in this time so that you're not just looking at COVID-19, but also recognizing there might be other information out there that we need to engage with. That's a really great question. At this moment in time, it makes sense that COVID-19 is the majority of the news we see and the majority of misinformation that we see. And it is difficult to sift kind of through that or past that to get to the other other things that are going on in the world. You know, we need to be a little patient with ourselves that maybe that's all the news that we can actually gather right now. But that shouldn't last for too long, right? Like you do have to know, you know, there is a presidential campaign going on. There is the census that needs to be filled out. There are important things that are also happening in the world that we need to be aware of. I just hesitate with putting any more pressure on people right now. Right? <laughs> you know, do you, you got to do you. It's not a bad piece of advice to challenge people to look beyond the COVID-19 news and to find some other information about other things that are going on in the world and to recognize that there's some important topics that we should still be looking at. And so it's almost like a challenge for people who want to be informed that if you really want to be informed, that you need to be informed about all of the other stuff too. I also think we need to recognize that people are troubled and and having a hard time right now. And so we have to go to the core of the issue and it's people's safety and people's health. And that's why fighting the the worst of the worst misinformation in this moment in time actually has to be a priority. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I want to do a shout out for fact checking right now. I always say that, you know, fact checking is not media literacy, like fact checking is a tool in a media literacy toolbox. But we want to think about information in a more nuanced way than just is this false or this is fiction, right? But this very moment in time, fact checking misinformation that's coming at you very quickly is actually a really, really good tool. And I wanna do a shout out to the fact checkers out there, especially, you know, our friends at Pointer and Political Act. They are doing like hundreds and hundreds of fact checks a day, specifically about misinformation about coronavirus. And that is hard work. They're doing it because they understand the health consequences if they don't do it. For anyone that, is consuming a lot of information right now and is kind of overloaded with information, use fact checking, use these sites that are doing, you know, daily fact checks around coronavirus and get to them before you share. It's a valuable tool at a time where we have this fire hose of information and use it on your feed when you see stuff like be the media literacy police if you can and just like put the the quality information out there, put the facts out there, um, make your feeds media literate space so that your followers and your friends are seeing those skills as they go through their feeds. And I would also say, don't be afraid to speak up when you see something that you know is not right. You don't have to like berate somebody or call them out. I think it, it, it's okay to have the courage to speak up in a digital space uh, to make sure we're getting the information we need to get through this uh, safely. Yeah, I think that's where fact-checking links are great. Like, you can just drop in a PolitiFact (laughs) link, like, sorry, guys, you know, and you just put it in there and you're not... A lot of people very innocently share things, right? They think they're being helpful. They think they found something. So we just, we have to teach people. That's why we're here, right? We have to educate people. I can't thank you enough for doing this with me. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you for having me. To become a member of the National Association for Media Literacy Education, go to namely.net and sign up. You have been listening to News in Context. Music in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing News in Context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, and PRX. We're also on Twitter at News in Context SF, and you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening.